All righty, let's get this show on the road. Good evening, beautiful people, and thank you for joining us this evening or this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us for our inaugural edition of In The Soup, a reflection program where every two weeks we are sitting down with an artist and a specialist, sometimes an amalgamation of the two, and speaking about the issues and situations that are keeping us up at night. Uh, today's edition will be focusing on COVID-19, the effects of COVID-19 on the creative sector and the um, society more broadly, and the Black Lives Matter movement that we've uh, been witnessing having global effects uh, over these past few months. And our fantastic guests today are Felicia Olusanya, a spoken word artist of Irish Nigerian descent, and Joshua Allen, a non-binary artist and activist from Brooklyn, New York. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us. My name is Kopano Maruja, and I am a performance artist, a writer, a cultural worker, and currently working at the Boret as a programmer and dramaturg. Um, before we go forward, I would like to go over a few house rules. Uh, for how we're going to be conducting the Zoom. So you'll see that there is at the bottom of your screen a chat function that will open a chat um, dialog box on the right. And that chat function is specifically if you have kind of technical questions, if perhaps the uh, video or the sound is delaying, please don't hesitate to let our technicians know through that particular chat. Or if there's something that you'd like to share with everyone, maybe a resource, maybe a comment, um, that will be the place for the chat. Um, and if you have, we're going to be having a Q&A section at the end of the engagement, or maybe I'll um, add them in as we go. We'll have to see. Um, but if you have any questions that you'd like the panelists to ask, I'm going to ask you to use the Q&A function, which you can also find at the bottom of your screen. If you do put the questions in the chat, it's very likely that it will be drowned out by all the other information that's there. So I do suggest that you put it in the Q&A dialog box that you can find at the bottom of your screen. A reminder that this session is being recorded, um, just so you know that if you are asking questions and your name comes up um, in the conversation that that is being captured and will be later uh, presented and um, saved on our website for later viewing. So just so that is known. I think that is all the house rules. Perhaps I've forgotten some, so I'm gonna invite our technicians to plop those in the chat if I've forgotten anything. Joshua is joining us with a red lip. We love to see it. <laughs> oh, there's so much glorious melanin in front of me. It's fantastic. I love it. Um, well, In The Soup would not be In The Soup without The Soup. So part of what we have decided to do for In The Soup is to invite an artist to uh, cultivate and curate a very specific soup for each edition. Um, from the inspiration of what's happening in the, in the conversation. And for the month of July, we have Fiona Hallinan, an Irish artist and researcher who has curated a wonderful beetroot soup for us. Um, so I wanna give the word over to Fiona, if you can introduce yourself very briefly, who you are, what your practice is, um, and further introduce the soup and guide us through the ritual that you've prepared for us. Thank you, Copano, for the beautiful introduction. And thank you so much, uh, Devarut, for having me. It's really nice to be here. So as Copano mentioned, um, I'm an artist and a researcher, and I work with food a lot in my practice, often as a way of kind of augmenting a situation and um, of drawing out conversation. So I was really, really honored to be invited to do this because it's such a sort of great series of conversations and speakers and I hope that this soup can be a way that we can come together even though in this situation we're um, all apart in different places. So for the first edition I really wanted to do something that highlighted and brought awareness to this sense that we are all coming to this conversation from really different contexts and so I thought it would be nice to work with the kind of a very simple base soup and then to offer all these kind of complementary textures and flavors that you can slowly and meditatively put on top of them. So for today, some of you maybe have prepared some of the things that I suggested in the recipe that was shared online. Um, but for those of you who haven't, I hope that 
I'm just going to do like a little quick demo of preparing it now and maybe we can just treat it as um, a kind of short meditative practice just to bring awareness to where we are today in our environment, whether or not you have the ingredients in front of you. And perhaps as Campano suggested, if you don't, you could take the opportunity to go and make a cup of tea or just to rearrange your surroundings. The soup is really just uh, one possibility. Um, so for the purposes of this, I'm going to turn my camera around so you can see uh, what I've got down here. Um, and oh, yes, Kapana, thank you. <laughs> so any of you who have prepared the ingredients, perhaps we could do this together. And um, what I would suggest we do, again, just generally to bring some awareness to where we are right now, is that we start by taking in a breath together and really simply counting to six as you inhale and counting to six as you exhale. And maybe we continue that. And while we're doing it, I'll plate up a little delicious soup for myself here and I can talk through what's going on top of it. And hopefully you'll be doing it together. And if not, this recipe might inspire you for future cooking experience. Okay, so I'm gonna begin. I'm the only one that can be heard. So you'll have to be guided by my breath. Okay, so the soup that I suggested, as Kapana said, is a beetroot soup. And one of the reasons I wanted to choose this is because obviously beetroot has this beautiful pink color. And the ingredients for this are very, very simple. It's just beetroot, cucumber, avocado, spring onion, and garlic. And then you can add, if you want, some chili, yogurt, or coconut milk or salt and pepper to that. And I added garlic as well, and a little bit of yogurt to this for the color, most of all. Okay, so Kapano, are you gonna do this with me? <laughs> and now I'm just putting a little bit of yogurt on top. And if you look at the recipe, there's a suggestion there for a vegan version, which is a cashew cream. You make that just by soaking cashew nuts with some dates and then blending them up. Um, okay, so next, I think I'm gonna go for this. This is a pumpkin seed oil, so it's got this really beautiful green color. But another reason I thought this soup was nice was the, the base, again, it's like a cold vegan soup, but all of the toppings can and should just be kind of a mixture of things that you can get in your environment so using maybe little bits of leftovers or jars of things that you have left over and um, this one is a dukkha so this is toasted cumin fennel coriander seeds sesame seeds and lots of pumpkin seeds and then it's mixed with some salt and then here i'm going to add some deep fried capers they're kind of crispy, you can see. So one of the nicest kind of additions to beetroot, because beetroot, beetroot has such a earthy flavor. And I recently read about the flavor of it described as being like a garden shed. Um, it goes really well with sour things. So a lot of the recipes that I suggested have that kind of sour flavor. These pickled capers is one example. This is cayenne pepper. And I like it a little bit spicy. I'm going to put a bunch of herbs. These are from the garden. There's dill, parsley, basil, and mint. And then This is that cashew cream that I mentioned earlier, but this one I blended with some spinach and basil. So it's like really beautiful green color. Rye croutons. And finally, this is pickled mustard seeds. So they're mustard seeds that are just blanched a few times in boiling water. That takes the bitterness out of them and then put in a mixture of vinegar, sugar, and salt. 
And again, they've got this really, really nice sour flavor that I love. Okay, I think that's finished. I hope that this was a pleasant experience for you and that if you're looking at a plate in front of you, that it feels satisfying and exciting and it's going to nourish you for the rest of this conversation. Thank you. Most deaf, most deaf. Hallelujah to that. I feel so embarrassed because I'm looking at your plate and it's literally a work of art. <laughs> Got these chopped up spring onions and some coconut yogurt. And I thought I was being creative. I was like, oh, she is going for it today, but clearly not. <laughs> this is setting the, the tone. It's the first one. <laughs> we can get competitive. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it is absolutely delicious. Thank you for curating this wonderful soup for us, Fiona. Thank you, Copano. <laughs> oh, tidy, tidy. I hope everyone is enjoying their soup or their tea or their water and is sufficiently hydrated and ready to go into the meat of the discussion. Before we begin, I would like to give the word over quickly to Felicia, for you to introduce yourself in your own words. I gave a very brief introduction of who you are, but I feel like you contain multitudes. And it'd be lovely to hear who you are, how you are, where you are. Hi, Kofano. How are you guys doing? Um, first of all, Fiona, your soup looked incredible. So sorry that I didn't participate. Crazy day. But it looks great. And Kofano, yours looks delightful too, so... Don't sell yourself short. Um, so I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. I'm here in Dublin, Ireland. It is a rainy, rainy day, but it's still a good day. Um, I'm a poet, performer, playwright, and I write a lot about um, social issues. I do a lot of programming work on shows um, in relation to hip hop and rap and poetry. Um, I do some workshops, um, I write plays, um, I respond to social issues within communities uh, that pertain to me. I talk about femininity and personal growth and identity and race and everything else in between. Uh, so that's what I do and that's how I am. Fantastic, lovely to hear it and thank you for joining us once again. Joshua, I'd like to give the word over to you to hear who you are, what you do and how you're doing. Yes, oh my God, thank you so much for having me and I'm really glad to be here in this great conversation today. I'm looking forward to learning more about um, the work that's going on on your side, Felicia, and hopefully kind of building on the intersections of um, of uh, the many issues that are going on in our, our world today. I think when we have the chance to come together and to have conversation, we have the potential to change the world. So I'm really, really glad to be here and have this conversation. So my name is Joshua Allen. I use the gender neutral pronouns they and them. I am based in Brooklyn, New York. I'm here in Brooklyn right now. It is the middle of the summer. It's a summer afternoon and we're experiencing some super, um, interesting thunderstorms. Like it's been hailing in the middle of summer, even though it's really hot. Um, and this kind of um, creepy context is going on in terms of the weather and the environment while the city is kind of on fire. We've been having uprisings and protests daily. Um, New York City is in the process of pass passing a new budget and a lot of activists and organizers all across the city are kind of fed up with our tax dollars being used to oppress us in our communities. And so we're standing up and fighting back. And I'm taking a step back to share more about who I am and what my work is. Um, I am the founding organizer of the Black Excellence Collective. It is a grassroots organizing hub for and by young queer and trans Black people here in my community. We use community organizing, art, and direct action to impact positive change in the world around us. And um, me personally, my work is um, centered around the intersections of racial and gender justice. Um, I like to describe it as um, my interest and my passion as the fact that queer and trans Black people particularly young people have been some of the world's most valuable contributors to social justice movements, to art, literature, academia, entertainment, fashion, music, and so much more. 
Although our communities are such worthy and valuable contributors and we contribute, our, our labor makes billions and trillions of dollars in revenue in all of these industries from year to year, that wealth is not reflected in our communities. My work as an artist, an activist, a writer, and a community organizer is to reckon with that injustice and to make a world where the wealth that our communities create is finally reflected in our communities. That is so beautiful and so erudite, and that work is so, so important in this particular moment as it has always been. So I thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I know that you're in the middle of a very intense period with many protests and a lot of activation where you are. I know that you have a meeting that you need to attend at the city hall right after this that is about the budgets that you were speaking about previously. So I'm gonna make sure that I keep my eye on the time and make sure that we end it timelessly so you can continue to do this fantastic work that is liberating all of us. Thank you so much. So I want to take a bit of a step back or go into a little bit of a time machine to the past few months uh, where we saw a completely unprecedented global um, uh, situation with COVID-19 that completely changed the way in which all sectors across the world had to operate and really indicated the ways in which our relations to one another across borders, across thresholds of our houses um, are definitely in relation with one another and dependent on one another. And the effects or the situations that are taking place in, let's say, China have a huge impact on other places and the ways in which we respond to those things, um, the events that are happening in different countries, the events that are happening next door has a huge impact on what we can and cannot do ourselves as individuals, as individual nation states, as individual communities. Uh, and I want to hear from you, Felicia, how you feel COVID-19 has impacted you. What kind of adjustments had, did you have to make in terms of doing the work that you do, the poetic and artistic work that you do, and the, the, the kind of uh, social justice or social oriented work that came about as a result of COVID-19? Thank you for that question, Kapanda. I was just, um, when COVID-19 essentially happened to Ireland or became a reality that Ireland had to concern itself with, um, everything came to a standstill. Um, and I think every sector was hit, but I feel like the art sector was hit particularly in Ireland. And we took, we had to take a pause at everything. Uh, I, I remember the, the day everything shut down. I was getting, um, I was getting emails back and forth. This was during one of the busiest times in Ireland, essentially, essentially for the art scene, because um, it was doing St. Patrick's Parade. It was doing St. Patrick's Weekend. So there was going to be a lot of shows. It was going to provide a lot of um, wealth within the art community. Um, and essentially, it would um, impact my life financially greatly. So when everything came to a standstill, it was, you know, it was... I'd say a terrible, difficult time for everybody. Um, and we all had to adapt and adjust and acclimatize really, really quickly to how we would, res one, respond to the situation, and secondly, how we would survive um, in the next coming months, given the uncertainty that we were going to be faced with. Nobody had um, encountered COVID-19 um, as a country like maybe years in advance to this. We, this is the first time our generation was experiencing something of this magnitude. So it was, it was essentially everything was going digital. And as soon as everything went digital, it was like, okay, we had a game plan, if that made sense. Well, that's how it felt for me that, you know, we have a game plan. Um, you had to adjust to how you present your work, how you market your work, um, how you produce your work. Um, learning how to do a lot of things on your own remotely as well, learning how to operate a camera differently, okay? Um, because essentially, when everything was normal, I wasn't doing everything by myself. Not to say I am, but how work gets produced is very different when you can't be in physical contact with each other. And so even it's, it's um, affecting us even in how we um, stage shows, not a lot of us know the next time we're going to be on stage. Luckily for me, I know, okay, the next time I'm going to be on stage is not till September. I haven't been on stage since March. That's a long time for a performing artist. So it's impacted how I present my work a lot. Um, learning that there's different ways to give away your baby and still um, find value in it and still be respected as the art form that it is and it not losing um, value because it's changed 
its tangibility or its form. Um, that's another interesting thing that and how we um, how it gets priced as well is an interesting conversation. Value and currency and how um, when you're not when you're not paying a ticket to come and see somebody on stage versus you're coming to see me, you know, in a Zoom meeting. Is valued the same way. Um, is it valued the same way? So there's a lot of interesting, nuanced conversations that comes about within the art form. Another is a big conversation about how the government is providing for artists during this time. There was a big conversation here in Ireland. We only got about a million euro dedicated to the entire art sector at the beginning of COVID 19. And it was like, everybody went, what? How are you looking? <laughs> How are we gonna eat? And luckily, there was a lot of people in the art sector that said something that stood up, and and we were like, no, we are an important part of what Ireland is. The arts are an important part of what culture is. So why are we undervalued? Um, and luckily, we had a boost in the in the what am I call it? <laughs> you know when you have a brain fight. <laughs> You know, we, we luckily got an increase in the amount of money that was dedicated to the art sector. Um, we had people like this is Pop Baby speaking up and writing letters, pleading to the government that, you know, we can't not be provided for, we can't not be taken care of. Um, and luckily, Ireland is stepping up to the plate. But yeah, um, COVID-19 has definitely impacted the art sector here in Ireland in a, such a different, different way. And we found a way to both respond and live and share our art in new, creative, and innovative ways. Yeah, thank you so much. You, you raised something so important about um, the way in which COVID-19 has had such a huge impact on the economy and how it raises this clear, um, these clear kind of disparities within the economy and the, the ways in which capitalism operates to create these kinds of tiers or these kinds of hierarchies and who is prioritized in a pandemic, who is prioritized in, in times of scarcity and who is prioritized in times of, or in times of mass scarcity and in, in times of mass um, distress. And Joshua, I know that you do a lot of work at that intersection, looking at the mechanisms of capitalism and the ways in which it creates and um, facilitates oppression for different people at different intersections. And I wonder for you, how was the experience or how has the experience been? Because I also know that the, the United States is still in a very delicate position in terms of where its infection rates are. Um, and I, I wonder for you, what has the experience been in, in that regard? I mean, yeah. So, I mean, maybe the big picture first, um, I want to challenge that idea of scarcity because I, in, in the United States, in a lot of different countries, we have more than enough resources to be able to deal with a, a public health crisis like this, particularly a public health crisis that was predictable, right? Pandemics mm -hmm. like this come around every hundred years and they have been for thousands of years. Any scientist, researcher, or physician could have told you this was going to happen. And in one of the wealthiest nations in the history of the world, I think we're also trying to figure out how it is that our healthcare systems were looted years before this pandemic came, how we didn't have proper access to masks, to um, PPE, to any of the PPE that not just the citizenry needed, but also that the people working that our essential healthcare workers needed, that our grocery store workers, that our pharmacy workers, that our healthcare physicians, everyone. I mean, the, I mean, basically the way that this works is that the system of unfettered capitalism has gotten so extreme and so unsustainable that the members of our government work in tandem with the corporations to steal the wealth through tax breaks or through take, literally just taking our tax money. Um, and so they exploit the poor and working class communities. They exploit the middle class, the overwhelming majority of the people who live in this nation. They take our money and they pocket it themselves. <laughs> and so this is why we're in a situation now where the infection rates have skyrocketed and we don't have the proper resources, personal protection equipment, um, research or infrastructure needed to meet this pandemic when we're more than capable. And so that is kind of like the context with which we started COVID-19. And that's why you see the explosion here. Um, also, there is, um, I mean, just being realistic, no one, uh, no one really takes or has been taking the social distancing measures seriously. Um, 
this is a, a place where everything is about individualism. Everyone does what they want to do all the time. Um, and it doesn't really have to kind of be based on facts or information. It's really kind of more about personal expression, I think, <laughs> is how people approach problems here. And so this, um, all of these factors together have kind of made us a hotbed of COVID-19. And I don't think it's going to go anywhere anytime soon. It's been really awful. Um, and so that's kind of like the big picture. Um, and then also, I guess, for maybe more context, as a community organizer with the Black Excellence Collective and also someone who works with a number of other community-based organizations here in New York City and across the country, the conditions that people in our community were facing were already dire. People are already dealing with issues of housing insecurity, food insecurity. We were already dealing with, with mass violence, not just on a state level, but also interpersonally, particularly in our Black trans communities. Um, many of the joblessness, job insecurity, these were issues that were going on before COVID-19. And so once the onset of the pandemic broke out, um, and it continued to be one of the worst in the world, the, the most marginalized members of our community, particularly Black queer and trans people, Indigenous queer and trans people, were um, were uh, devastated by these issues. And so as a community organizer, our work kind of stepped into high gear. And um, I've been doing, I, I mean, as, as much work as I possibly can, the Black Excellence Collective started a mutual aid fund to give out one-time $500 micro grants because our government was not giving out money to the people. Um, we, a lot of really awesome organizations like the Okra Project have been delivering free and healthy meals here in Brooklyn. Um, an organization called For the Girls has been raising money to help people cover their rent or to stop evictions. Um, but it's been a really challenging predicament here where the government does, takes all of our money and then does not provide us with the resources that we need to survive. And so it's really been um, those of us, leaders in the community, who have been stepping up to take care of each other, to support each other, and make sure that our communities um, are, are supported in such a pivotal time. And then taking that to the, the micro level, the more personal, I really appreciate what you brought up, Felicia. I'm a working artist as well. A lot of my income comes from public speaking, it comes from performing, it comes from traveling. And um, of course I was unable to do this anymore. And so um, I, I've been thinking a lot about why, why is it that my, how is it that my value changes from uh, the virtual space to the physical space? What is it that I'm actually being compensated for? Am I being compensated for my physical presence? Am I being compensated for your ability to touch me, to see me, to smell me? And I wonder as artists, if we can have this conversation, how does our value translate into the digital space and the physical one? And why is it that we have to accept reduced rates or, or a, a lack of respect or value for our work because it's being performed digitally in a world that's ever changing? And so um, I really appreciate you bringing that up because um, in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, COVID-19 has had a large um, impact that I think we should be talking about, but also on a personal artistic level. It causes um, a number of kind of internal crises all the time of now trying to reconfigure what is your worth and your value in an ever-changing world. Thank you for such a far-reaching and intersecting response and raising so many, so many uh, pertinent points. Um, I really appreciate what you said about this pushing back against this idea of scarcity because uh, our governments definitely present to us this, this kind of idea that, oh, they are, they are li there's limited capacity, there's limited resources, we can only um, disseminate in such and such ways and put in a disproportionate amount of responsibility on the individual. So I, I love what you bring up about raising that scarcity and that, that hyper-individualism that then manifests in the responsibility of people to support their communities and support themselves landing squarely on their own shoulders. Um, Felicia, I wonder for you, like how have you been experiencing navigating that, that kind of um, friction between how there is this uh, this perceived presentation of scarcity um, and being expected at the same time to still produce work, to still produce work at a, at a, at a high level, being invited to speak on panels such as this or to be to, to, to speak on podcasts um, about issues as expansive as anti-racism and capitalism and the intersections thereof. I was listening to the podcast that you were on um, for the Irish Woman's Time. Um, and you said something so interesting about these, these gestures that are happening, these small gestures that are happening on social media in relation to anti-racism and Black Lives Matter, uh, majoritively from white people, don't extend far enough. They don't extend far enough 
outside of the personal. Um, and so I wonder for you, how has that navigation been taking place, that navigation between the personal and the kind of systemic and the, 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 the collective? Wow, <laughs> that's a loaded question. <laughs> Oh gosh, um, I think it's such a detailed question and I, I'm gonna take it in bits. I think navigating, navigating the individual and the systemic is so nuanced because and value and knowing when to say yes and how knowing how to bargain your price up. I think because a lot is happening in such a concentrated amount of time, um, what I mean by that is coronavirus, Black Lives Matter, the marches, the protests. These are all not particularly new things happening, but the fact that everybody is still or everybody's movements are restricted and everybody is kind of forced to pay attention to the same thing at the same time. I feel like that has uh, nearly imploded the effects or exploded the effects um, of these issues, and rightly so. But more than anything else, finding how to still navigate your value in the midst of all these things currently affecting you as both an individual, as an art, and as an artist, and as a black person, and all these layered identities is tricky because there's some. There's some moments where or there's some events that I've been invited to or panel discussions that I've been invited to and, and I've done for free or um, just participated because I feel the, the moment is more important than the value nearly um, or the value that I particularly bring to it. Um, and not that the value is less, it's just feeling that you have to, you have to control the narrative of whether to place value on it or not. And not feeling that um, it's hard to explain because it feels like not feeling that like um, you're guilted into having to weigh it as important more than yourself, but knowing that the moment requires you to speak and maybe the people organizing it don't currently have the funds, but the conversation is important. You know, do you understand what I mean? So it's like navigating this space where you're like, okay, I have to choose these issues over what value I particularly bring to them. And then to have the conversation and that becomes a sacrifice. And then there's other moments where you're like, I need to, I need to eat or um, I need to provide for myself. So it's, it's, it's always, it always seems like a gut feeling per instance. Um, but also the great thing about COVID-19 and, and that's such a weird thing to say, even the great thing about it, because it's like nearly that you can't, ever benefit from the situation but yeah having good moments in the midst of the lockdown and um having people have that concentrated feeling um it nearly feels great to still be um nearly feels great to still be seen and still be found value in and like there's a lot of people like oh okay you need to speak on this or i'd like you to speak on that and it's important for you to speak on this and it's great if it benefits the conversation, but it's also great that people find value in and value in you and your contribution to the, these conversations. So yeah, it's all, it always feels like a gut feeling thing. It always feels like something you need to keep navigating and really in relation to anti-racism, one thing I've been struggling with a lot in relation to that conversation and going on platforms and I've been quite picky about where and how I speak about this issue um, and the platforms that I um, I'm okay going on is that I've had awkward issues and probably my first speaking about this publicly of, you know, just feeling like my experience is being jacked for ratings or um, you want me to participate because it's a hot topic and you can always feel that feeling. And I've turned down a few things because I've just felt like I don't want it to be I don't want it to be a hot topic to you. I'd rather it be on a platform that I know that values this conversation and that cares about this conversation beyond, you know, let's slip in a black person to talk about their experience. And that's another thing that I've been finding a lot of discomfort with as well, that like in the, in the conversation of racism or anti-racism, um, feeling like I have to say my personal, personal 
awful experiences for you to understand racism and but also feeling like oh I don't want to silence people that feel the need to have these conversations and express the trauma that they have experienced it's just my feeling of not wanting to commodify that part of myself for the conversation does that does that make sense um so yeah it's been really tricky um but it's feeling like I have to trust my gut in each situation in relation to conversation about value, in relation to conversations about whether I should be speaking about something or not. Um, and in relation to how these systems treat me while um, needing me to benefit from it also. Yeah, Felicia, that makes so much sense. Thank you for sharing that 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 friction between um, that that beautiful way that you put it. I don't know if I'll phrase it exactly, but like having the 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 weight of the moment of the importance of the moment weigh on you so much that you have to make decisions between do you sacrifice the importance of this moment or do you sacrifice your ability to sustain yourself with rent, with food, etc. And disproportionately, people at the intersection of blackness and femininity and queerness are having to be making these choices in this moment because historically, these are the identities that are the most oppressed or experience the most kind of aggregated oppression. Um, and I suppose on that point, um, Joshua, you were involved in what was a historic protest outside the Brooklyn Museum in support of black trans lives, speaking about that very intersection um, and the, 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 the way in which the Trump administration has been trying so hard in, on, on the level of legal um, opposition or legal uh, pressure to um, suppress the voices of trans people, black trans people, and the ways in which the, the disproportionate violence that black trans people and black trans women experience is erased by the moment that we're witnessing globally um, with the Black Lives Matter movement. And I was wondering if you could speak to that point somewhat. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, <clears throat> many people in our community were already kind of being crushed under the weight of what was going on pre-coronavirus <clears throat> and pre the uprisings. And so I think that um, we decided to host this action um, at, in front of the Brooklyn Museum, which is in my neighborhood, because we wanted to kind of, um, we wanted to make sure that the, the contributions of those in our communities which have, have been so great. I mean, the reason that we have pride in New York City and then also across the world is because of the Stonewall rebellions that took place here only 30 minutes from my house. You know what I mean? There is a radical history, a decades long history of, of particularly black and brown queer and trans people standing up and fighting back here in New York City. And, and the, the legendary struggle of this community has had ripples all across the globe. And so I think that we're really kind of just like fed up of being ignored and being erased. And um, uh, to one, one of the speakers, one of my great friends, Raquel Willis, was saying um, that a lot of uh, white queers get to worry about legislation and policy while black queers have to worry about dying in the street. And I think that that is a, a, um, a really important point to raise here. The Supreme Court, of course, made whatever decisions they did about discrimination. I think maybe it was one or two days after our historic march on Brooklyn with 15,000 people. But um, to be honest, for me, my motivation to the streets that day and my motivation to mobilize my friends, my neighbors, my family, everyone to come and to finally stand up with us and to fight back was not because of policy legislation. Um, it was because of the, the murders that have been close to me. You know, I have friends who have passed away, people that I know who I'm very close with. Um, gosh, just two days before we had our action, um, a young lady in Philadelphia who it was a friend of a friend of mine was found in a suitcase floating down the river. And these are the issues that mobilized us to the streets. These are the things that we're passionate about. These are the things that we need to change. Quite frankly, we could care less what the government is doing because they're gonna fall soon. I mean, it's, it's clear as day. <laughs> they're kind of doing themselves in right now. Um, and so they're kind of on their last breath. And so the point of this action was to bring awareness to the issues that our community faces, the leadership that our community has provided to our local hometown and also to the rest of the world for decades long that has for too long been erased and ignored from history. And also to say that as we forge a new world in the midst of these uprisings, as we begin to think about how we can create a space for ourselves where Black Lives Matter 
where people have access to some of the most basic human rights that we've been denied for so long, that Black trans people will be leaders in this moment, that we have a voice, and that that voice needs to be heard and included, period, full stop. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to all do this together. And I think that's what it was all about. And I think for me, it was a kind of, um, it was a really full circle moment because I've been doing this work, like I said, for a very long time in New York City, and it was not... um, Of course, this kind of confluence of events has got people more motivated to take action. But I remember we used to do similar actions and maybe like a couple hundred people will show up. And I remember, I think we did one in in Brooklyn in 2017 and a thousand people came. And I was so proud. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it's a thousand people. Um, (laughs) And so it feels nice that after all these years of fighting and standing up and putting in the work, and also it's, it's not like a, it's not a basic or liberal message about, oh, Black trans people matter. This is the way we make all Black lives matter. No, it's a radical message of all human beings in the 21st century deserve housing, deserve health care, deserve the right to live without threat of violence and deserve to not just survive, but to thrive. That's the message that we have. A message to empower poor and working class people, to empower black, brown, and indigenous people that is explicitly anti-colonial. And these are the messages that we have been raising. And that's, I think, why the action was so historic. I think that people are just fed up with things being the way that they have been in the past. And it's time for us to do something new. And I've been really kind of honored to step in, to continue to walk in my leadership in my hometown over the last month or so as the uprisings have been going on. Mm, Come on with it. Thank you for the word. It's not even a Sunday and yet here we are in church. I I really want to raise up what you said about making that distinction between not focusing this um, moment and your activism and the work that both of you are doing on policy and legislation alone, but really that feeling place and that place of affect and immediacy and urgency. Um, And it makes me, I I was reading before this Audre Lorde's uh, poem, essay, Poetry is Not a Luxury, in thinking about the connections between the poetic and the political and uh, identity and the the ways in which we can lift up identity to not segregate, but to liberate all of us, to think about really like how do we use that thing to, to actually create bridges between us as opposed to the ways in which it has been used against us to create these kinds of divisions without being minimalistic or um, reductive in, in talking about all lives matter or erasive of the, the, the people that are, are experiencing the most violence at the most intersections. And, and there's this part in, in the essay where Audre Lorde writes, the white fathers told us, I think therefore I am and the black mothers in each of us, the poet whispers in our dreams, I feel, therefore I can be free. Poetry coins the language to express and charter this revolutionary awareness and demand, the implementation of that freedom. And I find what you say so instrumental or such a a kind of um, tangible example of taking um, examples of or or inspiration from the feeling place, taking examples from um, immediate affect and as opposed to focusing on identity or ideas or really focusing on like, what does community mean to me and who do I care about? And the people that I care about are dying and you need to do something about that. And I think that is so powerful and the power of poetry and of art is that it can extend beyond legislature. It can extend beyond what we understand traditionally as politics to create these possibilities of bridges that perhaps we haven't seen before. Um, And Felicia, I know in your work as a spoken word artist and having witnessed you live performing before, that is so much of your practice. You really manifest in an in, in alchemic environment where we feel galvanized uh, to move beyond ideas and beyond uh, categorizations that are no longer serving us, but finding ways to, to, to harness feeling and affect into something that can be instrumentalized. And I wonder if you could p- potentially speak to that point um, in, in, in terms of your poetry, if it comes from that space, um, if that is an inspiration from you and where you imagine your poetry is, is guiding you towards. Thank you for that point. I I enjoyed you um, referencing Audre Lorde there. I was like, oh my God, uh, poetry is not a luxury. Um, brilliant essay. Anyway, um, in terms of what poetry can do um, and how I use poetry and the, the way I use poetry, I think 
as an artist, one of the things that I say um, that concerns me the most is that I believe as an artist, you are to reflect the times that you're living in at the least. Um, and I believe that that's one of my favorite things to do with my art is to reflect the times I'm living in, is to embody what is going on, is to project what is going on in whatever ways that I can. And I believe that poetry um, really does entwine strangely with politics because um, it has a way of speaking to the subject without um, giving you the jargon of the subject. Um, it has a way of breaking down what the frame of what the issue is and getting to the human part of the conversation. That's what I use poetry for. And in terms of um, how I'm currently responding to what's going on in terms of the Black Lives Matter issue and in terms of COVID, um, I've, I've really tried to um, put my words where my mouth is. Um, I've really tried to not just speak on Twitter because I've done a lot of that. Um, and, and not that that's not okay if that's all you do is and can provide is speak on Twitter. Um, but I'm very much of the kind of person that um, if I'm going to use my words, I'm going to have to create an action behind it. Um, that, um, that being that where my poetry comes from is from a deep, um, and meaningful place to me. So when I give it out to the world, it has to it has to matter and has to um, effect change in some way rather than wasting my words. So something I'm really, really excited about um, in terms of even speaking to the black the issues that concern black Irish people in Ireland um, would be direct provision. And uh, one of the ways is joining panels and discussing in that way. But um, I'm really excited about a project that will be out um, on Friday, this is not a low key plug, but I'm really, really excited about um, this creative way of getting information out there about direct provision issues, about how people are treated in direct provision centers, about the stats that pertain to these uh, the, to these women, these children, these men in these conditions from third world countries, as, as they call them. Um, I want to get out the information that. Um, people that are living in direct provision are five times more likely to have mental health conditions. Um, if you don't know what direct provision is, it is it's supposed to be a temporary holding center for asylum seekers that turns into um, deformed, denigrated places that these people live in for long periods of time with unhealthy conditions, with limited money, limited education, limited ability to work. And with these issues, they're not just issues to talk about. They're not just fun ways of discussing or um, highlighting issues pertaining to Black Irish people. They're, they're things that need to crumble under the new administration that has just come into government in, in, in Ireland um, at the moment under Fianna Fáil. So it's to challenge these um, this project on Friday is to, is to challenge the, the government, is to challenge the institution and using poetry, using my words, putting them out on these on these platforms like this way to, to get people to not just listen to the legislation, because I believe there are incredible people who are doing the work, trying to get the information out about legislation out there with Maasai and Merge, who are, who are institutions working and fighting about um, direct provision issues. But you know, beyond that, like beyond that incredible work they're doing, I want to get to also the human conditions, the human part that read this information and know that this is what is affecting the human person. If you do not understand the legislation behind it, at least, you know, these people are, you know, five times more likely to have mental health issues that you, you may not experience. That is a human condition. That is what I want and believe art can do and talk about and put in your face. I think art is, is to stand still the moment and to present what the moment looks like before you. That's what the artist embodies, the moment. Um, and I think that I, I hope I, I don't miss these moments, you know, and beyond just capturing it within, you know, a week when it's hot, you know, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So strong and so such important work that you're doing across so many different intersections. Um, I want to remind everyone that is uh, attending that if you have any questions, please feel free to pop those in the Q&A. We are about 35 minutes away from closing the session, so please get those questions in there if you do have any. Um, Joshua, I want to come back to you and something that you said in a previous interview for Blue Stockings magazine, um, that love is an abolitionist politic. And that really sat like 
resonated with me and sat in my body and i found that such a such a such a striking thing to to say and to take away love like uh love can bind us or like love is the the eternal law away from this kind of um liberal politic or this kind of uh, whitewashed politic of like let's love everyone and everything will be fixed but to really say that no love is is a radical gesture and is a radical posture um but i was wondering if you could take apart for us how you see those two connections love and abolition and what abolition means to you and looks like yeah absolutely thank you for that and thank you so much i, I didn't know that you were doing that kind of work felicia but i'm extremely grateful for your service to our community seriously thank you for what you're doing and, and raising awareness about it in an artistic way. It means a lot to me. So thank you again. Um, so yeah, love. Um, I think maybe maybe let's start from the, the place that we're in now, um, a system of capitalism, at least here in, in, in I, I know that police forces everywhere are different. Um, and I know that in America, we have a very unique one <laughs> and our, our, our very kind of long, centuries long um, history with police is, is, is different than other countries. Our police force in the United States started off as a uh, slave patrol. So basically the idea was that we didn't have police for a long time in the country. And as slaves um, or informally enslaved people started saying, goodbye, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm not doing this anymore. And moving around to other places, um, they formed a, a, a slave patrol units to have people go out and kind of retain these people back to the servitude of whatever owners or masters they may have had. And so um, the the idea with our police force and with our prisons in the country, it has evolved from that, that origin point to where we are today with a, a bloated mass incarceration system where on any given day, there's 2.5 to 2.75 million people in prison. Even though we're nowhere near the most populous country in the world, we have the largest prison population in the entire world. And so this manifests itself um, as a as a form of punishment that falls along racial lines and class lines and gender lines um, and uh, also um, disposes of people for making mistakes or oftentimes, honestly, just being dealt the wrong hand of cards. You know, the majority of the black women that we have who are being held in prisons or detention facilities today are in there for fighting back against domestic violence or rape or sexual assault. And so this is just one example of how our prison and policing system is totally unable to deal with the very real societies, uh, real issues that impact our societies. And they deal with it with punishment as as opposed to resources, healing, or transformation. And this is, um, I think, the, the, um, the crux of, I guess, what I'm really offering here with love being an abolitionist politic. I'm really interested in how we can meet the issues of our society. And it's not just uh, the issues of abuse or sexual assault, it's issues of poverty that lead to theft. It's issues of uh, generations of sexual assault. You know, people who have been sexually assaulted before as children or young adults are so much more likely to um, commit sexual assault in the future. Same thing with people who are victims of childhood domestic violence are so much more likely to commit domestic violence in relationships in the future. A lot of this trauma is generational. And I think that it's time now that we figure out ways to come together, to learn from each other, to love each other, to give ourselves a space and the ability to transform as opposed to disposing of others. Because in an ultra capital society that we live in today, what ends up happening is that the, the, um, the, the um, disposability of human beings leads to um, the justification of the exploitation of their labor. That's why we have people who are in our prisons today who are working day in and day out getting paid one to three US dollars an hour, you know, really slave wages or really unacceptable wages for any human being. And so I'm particularly interested in how we find ways to one, address these issues, of course, um, and then two, to learn, to grow and to heal with each other and to understand that oftentimes the manifestation of trauma, violence and harm in our community is a reflection of the issues that are underlying behind us every single day. Issues of poverty, of, of homelessness, of food insecurity, of, of self-esteem, of mental health issues, of generational trauma and so much more. Excuse me. So I'm very interested in um, in how we can come together and just like you said, Capano, not love each other in a liberal way of, oh, we can love each other through anything. But seriously, the finding ways to uplift and to support each other through these issues that now we're finally starting to have more awareness around. And I think that um, um, in order to create a world where we don't just punish and dispose of people, we have to radically love and honor each other, even the hurt and fucked up parts of us that exist inside. 
Thank you so much for that, Joshua. I think that that point of trying to find a way to grow together, heal together, even in the very real context of how much harm we do to one another and have done to one another is such a pressing point at this particular moment in history where more and more we are having revealed to us on kind of like in public discourse, the extent to which uh, we've experienced violence because of historical and generational legacies like colonialism, but also like capitalism and of the various kind of like slave um, uh, epochs that we've seen in not only the Middle Passage, but also in North Africa with the kind of Arab sl slave uh, roots, with the kind of legacy of the oppression of Irish people and travelers in Ireland um, and the intersections thereof with such a, is such a far reaching um, reality and that love, what we understand to be love needs to extend far beyond what we currently understand it to be to incorporate also that um, and I wonder for you, Felicia, when, when, when Josh was talking about radical love, um, because I know that you, I, I think you speak about this in one of your poems or something very, very close to it. Um, I wonder what does that look like for you or what do you imagine it could look like? Radical love. Ooh. Um, it looks like honesty. I think something that we're still, ooh, is this controversial to say? <laughs> um, one of the things that we're still struggling with as people in general, in all our forms and um, all our intersections is we still find it very hard to be honest with each other. And I think that's, that's the beginning of radical love. Um, I don't think we can truly love each other if we can't tell each other the truth, if we can't have truthful conversations, if we get mad at truthful conversations, like if we can't communicate, we can't grow any conversation we ever have. And I think that's what I'm, I thought, I think that's what we're struggling with a lot currently. Um, and I was a bit scared of that with Ireland. Um, I was scared that we might get to a place where we're pushing for, um, we're pushing for equal rights. We're pushing for no to racism and anti-racist sentiment and, you know, um, anti-racist um, displays of support. Um, and I find that there's a few people that, you know, even just having close friends that have close friends that are having these conversations kind of like, oh, you know, what's the big deal? Or I feel a bit like I can't really speak or you're hearing these opinions and you're like, oh, God. And I got really terrified because the worst, the worst thing in a conversation is having people that that act like they understand you, because then you start progressing in the conversation, thinking that these people are on the same ride as you. And you then suddenly you're at the end of the conversation and then there's a disconnect. Um, when you get to the end of conversation, you are supposed to progress to results. But when you get to the result stage of things, there is no results if both of you in the midst of the conversation weren't understanding each other and the other party was pretending to. So the reason for this analogy is I feel like this is what ha what is happening with a lot of conversations with a lot of us in the in. In, in social issues, whenever we're trying to progress or whenever we're trying to understand each other. Um, and we can't have radical love if we can't be honest with each other. And it's it feels really frustrating. Um, it feels really um, confusing as well because um, not every contribution to a conversation is necessary either. And then we are kind of left in this world where we're like, we're learning new ways of censoring each other. We're learning new ways of like, okay, labeling each other uh, when we disagree and it's like ah uh, sometimes those people are ass farts if that's, if that's okay to say sometimes they are ass, ass farts and nobody should even listen to them but it's like how do we progress in the conversation though so radical love honesty that's what i would say Thank you. I think that that sums it up so succinctly radical love and and honesty and being honest about the ways in which we participate in harm and in, and how we experience harm and finding ways to create support networks um, to, to, to hold all of those ruptures. <clears throat> Joshua, you say something interesting in an interview that I forget now where it is, or maybe it's one of your, your, your TED talk for Middlebury, um, but you talk about abolition as coalition building across difference. 
or, or something to that effect. And, and it makes me think of uh, what Toni Morrison said about um, racism. Um, and to quote her, she says, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says that you have no kingdom, so you dredge that up. None of this is necessary. There will always be one more thing. And that extends, I think, to how we understand or how identity politics has been co-opted um, to become something that doesn't speak with particularity to the ways in which we experience the world, experience violence, but also experience love and experience joy. But it has been used instrumentally by different administrations across the world to create these false divisions where there is actually unity and there is actually um, unified struggle. Um, and I wonder if you, if you can speak to how you imagine through abolition, we can build those coalitions. Thank you so much for that. And, um, and your, your incredible facilitation skills here, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, so I'm, I'm particularly interested in the coalition building, it's something that I love to do. Um, and uh, I'm so glad that she evoked Toni Morrison here because I mean, that, that, that has been the, the story of American history is the distraction that is racism and the kind of rat race of American exceptionalism where the, the idea is that if you get educated and if you work hard and you can succeed somehow, even though you know all data science and research shows us that 98% of people in this country are born and die in the same social class. So the, the, the dream of, of upward mobility and working hard and changing our life is 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 a farce. But um, I'm, I am interested in how we build coalitions um, within our, our communities, of course, to support each other around the very um, simple issues that we have. I mean, it's not rocket science to fix some of the issues that we have going on today, like homelessness or hunger or lack of health care. It's totally possible to do. What we have to do is take down the power structure that exists right now that exploits and hoards those resources. And that's, of course, a, a big part of the fight that we're engaged in every single day. But the, the other end of that is um, working on building around the connections that we have all across our, our nation and then all across the globe as well. And, and, it's, um, and so I, I find myself working in Black, queer, and trans communities um, and trying to uplift the stories of us Black, queer, and trans people, Black women in um, this movement right now. But over the, the past few years, that's why I'm really grateful you've been doing this work, Felicia. Um, I have been working to support folks who have been coming from Central America in migrant caravans to apply for asylum in the United States. And um, we, we, we have, they're called, um, detention centers or detainment camps here. And they're um, some of the most awful places on earth. I mean, they're really just um, internment camps, basically concentration camps. They keep people who have no else to go and are fleeing their homes because they're uh, afraid of, of being killed. And so I'm pretty, particularly interested in how we kind of deconstruct the myths of difference and separation between us, the myths that are perpetuated by borders, the, myth that, the, the myths that are perpetuated by racism, the myths that are perpetuated by classism, and the, the, the different um, capitalist constructions of a neoliberal nation state like the United States. And I think that the way we help challenge those borders and challenge those boundaries is to reach out to each other, to learn from each other, to work in solidarity and build coalitions with each other. Um, and so, yeah, since gosh, since I was 19 years old, I've been doing that work and I've been traveling all across the world and partnering up with different organizations who do similar work and who are interested in changing the world in a similar vein, but who maybe come from a different place or have a different color of skin or speak a different language. And I'll, I'll go even further to say that that requires more from us, right? If, if we want to do something different than what we're doing now, it requires more from us. You know, it requires us to, to study and learn different languages, not just because you can get paid more or get a better job, but because you want to be able to understand people, that because you want to be able to learn coalitions. And that's the kind of work that I've been doing, learning more about different cultures, learning more about different languages, going to places, being involved in movements, and then also building coalitions broader, because in the United States, I think we've done a really great job about that. We've been resource sharing, 
it's easy to get to each one another and we try to help each other. But I think that we've got to deconstruct the, the idea of nation states if we want to work together to challenge this power nucleus that is gripped the world right now. Because the 1% in this world, they work together. They work in tandem to oppress us. And so it's time for us, the working class masses of the world to come together and work in tandem to take that power back and hold it for ourselves. Thank you. That is really such a, a great summation of so many of the, the issues that we're facing and the, the possible solutions that we can that we can look to in doing this work of coalition building, doing this work of insurrection, doing this work of abolishing and removing these systems that oppress us, um, not just as individuals, but as collectives um, and understanding that there are so many ways and so many experiences of that kind of violence all around the world and that it's only through becoming um, Oh, I have a, a very dear friend of mine who, who said this thing to me once um, in a panel that we were in and, and she was like, uh, they were like, uh, we, need to, we need to learn to become fluent in one another. And that really is a summation of the work that is that, that we're being called to do to become, to become fluent in one another's struggles, to become fluent in, in each other's joy, to become fluent in one another's languages um, and the many different kinds of languages that, uh, um, that, those, that that language manifests in. Um, and it makes me think of um, that, that, that iconic interview that Nina Simone had, I forget where it was, I forget who was conducting it, but that iconic line, it's also in that no-name song, Freedom, um, where she says, you know what freedom means to me? No fear. And that like resonated through my bones. And I, I wanted to, 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 to um, redirect that question to you, both of you, um, what, what you imagine freedom might look like for you. See, Felicia taking a deep breath. <laughs> yeah. Take us away, sis. Oh, I love that you asked me about freedom. I've been obsessed with the concept of freedom for a while now. Um, so, oh, where did I take it back to? Um, last year, I had a thought. Actually, I had a little painting session, like workshopping with a bunch of kids uh, um, at an art camp. And I was painting, <clears throat> I did two paintings. I'll run through this part quickly. I did two paintings and one was called The Survival of Yellow and the other was Freedom. And I just, at first, I did the, first, the second one first and the first one second. So they weren't in order. So at first I just, I didn't understand what I was painting. So the first one was, um, it was just a bunch of colors and then yellow coming out of it at the end, just like the yellow color run, won the race. So I started with blue, because I'm looking at it right now. I started with blue, then red, and yellow won the race. That one is called Survival of Yellow. The second one was about freedom. So I used the same colors, but it was kind of like I painted wings, and the yellow was in the middle instead. So when I looked at both of them side by side, had like this epiphany. And it made me think about the year I was having and the struggle I had gone through, the, the stress of the year, the trying to make money, doing the full-time artist thing, trying not to screw up my life, trying to keep my education going, you know, keep learning as you do the art, as you maintain family, love, and relationship. And I realized that by the summer, I'd survived, and there was a lot of yellow in my life. There was a lot of, there was a lot of joy in my life. And the second phase, it felt like, an ascension process, you know? And I felt like all the yellow that I saved up, I'd surmised into how I bought my freedom. So I bought my freedom with surviving through the year, surviving through all the craziness, surviving, um, learning how to love, this, that, and the other with family. So I got all my yellow and I used it to buy my freedom. And that concept has stayed with me for the whole year up till this year. And I realized you can buy your freedom by how you, how responsible you are with your life. And my, my thing is that you can't ask for your freedom, right? You can't, you can't be like this since the whole black lives matter thing got crazy hot for the past few months, like people tweeting. There was a, there was a few people that were tweeting, Oh, please don't kill us. And they pissed me off. 
I'm so sorry. They really, they really annoyed me because don't appeal to the empathy of an oppressor. They don't already give a damn about you, right? Your freedom is for the taking. You're snatching that shit back. I hope I'm allowed to say the shit word. You're snatching, you're snatching that shit back. You're taking your freedom. And it sounds idealistic because yes, I am a poet. So maybe I do have those tendencies. But aside from the imagining, the dreaming and the believing, because that's what where I come in, I get you to believe in the shit that you're about to do. The believing in the concept that your freedom is already yours, that you can buy it by just being the responsible person you are, by being responsible to your person, by being responsible to your art, by being responsible to your your autonomy, by 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 like loving who you are and being free in your being. You can buy your freedom that way. And aside from it being idealistic, once you start believing it, when somebody threatens to take it, yeah, they're coming across like <laughs> a bad B. That's how I think about it. That's how I think about it. That's how I associate with the concept of freedom. That's how I engage with it on a daily basis, that it is mine and it's for the snatching. Yes, that is that is it. That and it, it makes me think of that like that that really famous Asata Shakur quote of um Nobody in the world, nobody in history has ever gotten their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of the people who were oppressing them. Um, and that kind of um, sentiment of re-empowerment to say that it is, it is you, you are who you have been waiting for and you have the responsibility to fight for your own freedom and to fight for the, inter- the freedoms of those around you because there's no freedom for one of us if there's not freedom for all of us. Thank you for putting that so beautifully. Um, Felicia, Joshua, what are what are your ideas on freedom? Yeah, um, I, I think uh, evoking the name of Asada Shakur again, where at the end of, I, I think it's, it's not from a letter to my people, but it was like from um, one of like the voice calls that she did um, after she was already in Cuba. And she talks about, um, she's like, I don't know what freedom is because I haven't yet experienced it. And of course, that's how I feel. Simultaneously, um, she she says that she feels like it's just the ability to live, to breathe, to survive and to thrive, to be who you are. Um, and that's a lot about how, a lot of what I've been thinking about and feeling lately. Um, I'm particularly interested, like I said before, and in, in how our communities can not only survive, but thrive. I feel like the survival part has been, it, it, that's what we've been trying to do for so long here. And obviously, you know, I, I know that I am a manifestation of, I, I come from generations of African people living in America who have survived. Um, we have demonstrated a, a centuries long ability to survive. Um, and, and I'd like to think, I, I know my, my, my current family who's here with me now is very proud of me. And I'd like to think the ones who are, who are gone are really proud of me too. But um, I, I'm interested in what it could look like to, to be able to excel, you know, and not like in a capitalist way, not like in, in an American dream kind of way, but like literally just to excel, to not have to worry about the threat of violence, to not have to worry about the constant discrimination or the mistreatment, but to be able to contribute my talents, my passion, my art, my ability, my intelligence to the world. And to, just like Alice Walker says, and I believe this, activism is the price and rent that we pay for living on this planet. And for me, freedom would be the ability to to pay my rent, to give back to the world that has given so much to me Um, and and to be able to do so without the the threat of, of, of discrimination or fear or violence and, um, and, and, and the last thing I'll say also is that for me, I'm, I agree that it's something to be taken, right? But I also imagine that freedom is a constant struggle. It's not like a, it's not a destination. It's not something that we grab one day. It's something that we need to struggle for and with forever, generation after generation, regardless of what changes this generation happens to accomplish. I think freedom is going to be a constant struggle, one where we always have to fight and constantly reimagine ways to live freely. Oh, that is such a beautiful phrasing of that. I, I really love what you say about re kind of um, positioning that question and not saying that it's so much about how much I can take, but how much I am in a position to give. And that when, when I reach a, a position where I, where my cup runneth over, that is what freedom looks like, where it, it can just be continuously um, given and it can pour out of me. 
um, and free other people or to, to not even free other people, but to manifest the greatness of other people. I think that's, that's such an interesting reframing of that and not just the ability to survive, but the ability to thrive as a right and not as something that is um, in the capitalistic sense earned. Um, and that, that, that idea of uh, the rent, uh, your activism is the rent that you pay for being on this earth. It's just like, oh, so revolutionary. Of course, it comes from Alice Walker. Um, I have to think when you were talking about Asata Shakur, I have to think of when I was part of the Rose Must Fall movement in, in South Africa, in Cape Town. Um, and we got this email from Asata Shakur and she was literally like, because we, we, we had been mobilizing to um, pressure the, the administration of the University of Cape Town to take down the statue of Cecil John Rhodes that was in the middle of the university. Uh, and she emailed us and she was like, if you have ropes, if you have chains and you have strong arms, you take that statue down. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is point blank period um and that really that really shifted um the way that i think about what it means to empower oneself to liberate oneself and what that might look like and what the mechanisms of that might be um i want to bring um our attention uh, or the attention of the attendees and the people that are watching to the fact that we are about 10 minutes out from the end of this so if there are any questions that anyone attending or watching has please feel free to shoot them in the Q&A. Or if you're watching through Facebook Live, please feel free to comment them in the comment section. And one of our technicians will transplant those into uh, the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar. Uh, I wanted to give the word back to you guys and to, to, to circle back to the initiatives that you were talking about before. Um, Felicia, you were talking about the uh, direct provisions um, event that is going to be taking place this Friday. Um, and Joshua, you mentioned the Black Excellence uh, Collective Fund uh, that you're currently uh, fundraising for and GoFundMe. Felicia, can you let us know how we can find that event? It, it, do we just follow you as Feli Speaks on Facebook and can we find the event through there? It's on Friday and it's not an event, but it's a launching of something. Um, I think I'm free to say it here. Um, it's coming out in two days. Um, there are a bunch of T-shirts that have facts, figures, and details about what direct provision is, what it does, who's running it, what money is running it, who in the country is running it. Um, so, yeah, it's really, and also it's designed to really take the attention back to what um, they said um, direct provision was supposed to be and what it actually turned out to be, um, as well as details of a poem that I wrote as well that is in support of um, ending direct provision so that everybody gets different backs. It will be on sale and all proceeds will go to Maasai and Merge that are um, working tirelessly for at the end of direct provision. So that is what I'm really, really excited about. It'll be out on Friday. It'll be on my page. I will put the link in my bio and all the details will be there. Fantastic. Thank you, Joshua. I see that you put the Black Trans Youth Fund in the comment section. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, I would be honored to. Um, and for any of, I can't see the attendees, but please, I'm going to give you the pitch. Come join us, join us, join us. Okay. So <clears throat> back in 2015, me and one of my best friends, she's an activist. She lives in Minneapolis, which is also, um, if you all are aware of the uh, the murder of George Floyd that happened on camera, she lives maybe 20 minutes away from where that happened. So she's one of my frequent collaborators, the other co-founder of the um, of the collective is kind of entrenched in the uprisings there. And I'm here on this side. And basically um, we've been doing this work for five years. Like I mentioned in the very beginning, the Black Excellence Collective is an organizing hub for and by black, queer and trans young people in order to organize around the issues in our community using art, community organizing, direct action, um, and now we're really stepping more into the space of mutual aid after the COVID-19 pandemic. And we hope to continue this because I think COVID-19 illuminated that so many people in our, in our communities needed support be before that, you know? Um, and so this is the work that we've been doing. Um, we've been leaders in this work for a very long time. Unfortunately for us and the world around us, um, people have not cared for a very long time. They have not uplifted this work, they have not followed this work, they have not donated to this work, they have not amplified this work. And I think now, after the murder of George Floyd on camera, 
after centuries of police violence in this country and also across the world. And also because of the, 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 the very pervasive spirit of white supremacy and anti-Black racism that happens across the globe. I think that now people are finally waking up to these issues or I, I don't, I don't want to say waking up. I think realizing that they can no longer ignore it anymore. And so um, we launched a campaign in order to expand our investment in our communities. Like I said, we've been doing this for so long with so little, and, and we really wanted to step up the fight to make a big and strong investment in our communities so that we can survive this extremely crucial period in our city's history in order to move forward in leadership in the future. And so... Um, Gosh, on Saturday, um, so about five days ago, we launched the campaign and we raised $100,000 in four days. Um, we are super, super excited and super, super proud. Um, we've never done anything like this before, but um, uh, like I said, we're ready to lead. We, we have been ready to lead. We have been leading. And so, um, so we decided to step into our leadership. Of course, in a 30-day campaign, when you raise the full goal in four days, well, you do, you extend the goal. And so now we are fighting on and we have a new goal of a quarter of a million dollar investment in our communities. Um, and I'm really glad and proud to be leading this campaign. If you all want to follow me on social media, on my Instagram, it's here on my little window. And I can put my Instagram here. You can also follow the Black Excellence Collective on Instagram. It's Black X Collective. I'll type it right here, at Black X collective. And you can follow us for the rest of the month to find out about what we're doing. If you're not able to donate, you can also just share the post. We're trying to make it really accessible, super decentralized. We have toolkits that we're sending out to folks where you can download the graphics, share with your Instagram followers, your Facebook friends, your family, and your text thread what it is that we're doing. We have sample copies, so you don't have to do anything. Literally just send the message around. We're super excited to be well organized. And like I said, we're ready to lead. And um, in the campaign, we have a full breakdown of exactly how we're going to spend the money. We're working on mutual aid. We're working on a bail fund, protest relief fund, um, and a community organizing academy to build up for the youth in our community. And so I'm super proud and honored to be leading this work. And I invite you all to come join us. Like I said, we've been doing it for so long for, with so little. Um, and I think that now that people are done ignoring white supremacy, at least for the moment, we're asking people to step into this fight with us. The work of racial and gender justice is not just for those of us who are impacted by it. All of us in society are not free and to all of us are actually free. And so we're inviting people now to come join us, to help us fundraise and to help carry the weight to help us live in a freer world. Yeah. Yes, that is uh, amazing and well, well, well deserved after all the work that you've been doing for so, so, so long. Such important work from both of you. It is absolutely astounding how you have artistic practices, your own personal lives and are so involved in your communities and shedding such important lights on so many different issues within your communities and outside of your communities in the struggle for liberation where you are. It is absolutely fantastic, amazing, inspirational. Thank you so much for taking the time to share what you've been doing and extending that work to us. Um, for those that are interested in following uh, Felicia and Joshua's work, I'll be sure to take all the links that they've shared with us and post it in the Facebook event um, of this um, of this webinar. So you can go there and you can find all of their details. You can, you'll, you'll be able to find the, the fund that Joshua's organized for the uh, Black uh, Trans um the Black Trans Fund, and it will also be on the website, on the website of Voret. Um, so you'll be able to find it on the Voret website and on the Facebook event that we made for this webinar. Um, I wanted to ask if there are any kind of closing statements that you guys want to give um, after this conversation, Felicia and Joshua. Just to remind everybody to take care of themselves. Um, it's just something I've been thinking about a lot today. Um, just stop, breathe, and take care of yourself. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Felicia. And yourself, Joshua? Um, yes, echoing that. Well, we need to take care of ourselves. Um, our lives matter. They have value. And I will also say, um, I, I want to echo what I just said at the end of that pitch right then. The work of creating justice in our society is not just on the marginalized members of our community. It's on all of us. And I think it's important. And this is kind of maybe one of the reasons um, when I was during the coronavirus pandemic, or, or it's still going on right now, but when it first started out, I was thinking, gosh, I need to just stay in the house. It's too dangerous, you know, to go out and protest. I'll be around other people. You know, I don't want anything to happen to me or my family, but look around. Things are happening to people every single day. You could be in your home and something could happen to you. 
here's the deal, is that none of us are free and to all of us are free. And in addition to that, we can't just sit around and watch or wait as the government comes for some of us or as capitalism screws over some of us. Because then when it's your time on the chopping block, who's going to be there to fight with you? This is what I'm saying. Our liberation is bound up with each other. And so I welcome you. I invite you to come help us now, finally, to step up and to carry the weight however you can, whether that's by donating, whether that's by sharing, whether that's by um, supporting people in your local community, whether that's by starting your own initiatives, finding a way where you could step up and help us carry the weight that we have been carrying on our backs for hundreds of years. We can change the world together if we work together, and I welcome you to do so. Mm. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. In, in the immortal words of Asata Shakur, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but, but our chains. Thank you so much, Felicia and Joshua, for joining us today. Thank you for all the work that you have been doing and continue to do and the inspiration that you bring into this world. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us for this super, super important conversation. Thank you for all the attendees on Facebook that I cannot see or can interact with directly, but thank you for watching from Facebook and your beautiful comments that you've been sharing with us from Facebook. And thank you to our technical team who made this possible. Um, I want everyone to know who, who's been watching. Like I said before, all of the links that we've mentioned will be in the Facebook event group uh, on Facebook and the uh, sites of Ret. And if there is any kind of feedback or comments that you want to share with us, you can share them with us at info at voret.be. That is I-N-F-O at V-O-O-R-U-I-T dot B-E. And on that note, I would like to wish you all a beautiful, beautiful evening, afternoon, morning, day, further. And until next time, stay safe, get free. <laughs>